Today we're going to go talk about the urinary system. And the urinary system is important because it's a filtering system. What are we filtering? Blood. So it's a way to filter the blood, remove waste products from the blood. We have other waste removal systems in the body as well. And the respiratory system was a way to get rid of extra carbon dioxide to get rid of that. Uh, sweat glands actually help to excrete um, some water, salts, and a little bit of urea. So next time you're at the gym and you see that sweaty guy that works out and then just walks away without wiping down the machine, just know that there's a little bit of pee in that sweat. Um, and then the digestive system, of course, helps us get rid of some of the metabolic byproducts of hemoglobin metabolism in the form of bile pigments. Uh, and the urinary system here helps us to get rid of uh, waste water. We have too much water oftentimes. It helps us to regulate ions and things like that. Helps us get rid of urea. And, and so there's a lot of things that are pulled out of the blood and end up in the urine that are waste products. Okay, parts of the urinary system, well, there's the kidneys. Uh, and the kidneys are connected to the urinary bladder via ureters. And of course, the urinary bladder drains urine out through the urethra. Now, where in the body are the kidneys located? Towards the back. So you all have dissected your cats now, right? Have you seen the kidneys in there? What did you have to do to get to them? Dig underneath. Dig underneath. Okay. The kidneys are actually what we call retroperitoneal. Okay. The peritoneum is that smooth tissue that covers the inside lining of the body cavity. And so you had to cut through that peritoneum to actually get to the kidneys. They're covered. They're not actually in the abdominal cavity anatomically. Uh, and they also have a nice capsule of fat surrounding it, right? That fat's actually important. It helps to hold them in place. Um, functions of the kidney. Well, regulate blood ions, okay? Make sure that we have the correct amounts of sodium, potassium, chloride ions, and so on. Regulating blood pH, okay? Making sure blood doesn't get too acidic or basic. What's the normal pH for a mammal of the blood? 7.45, Yeah, 7.45, 7.45, so 7.4 is fine. Now, let's think about people for a minute and say, um, can you think of something acidic that you would eat or drink? Lemon. Orange juice. Orange juice, lemonade, coffee, pH of about 5, Coca-Cola. You know, if that went straight into your bloodstream unbuffered, it would kill you, OK? But because your bloodstream is able to buffer it and because your urinary system is good at pulling out that excess uh, hydrogen ions and putting it in the urine, your blood pH doesn't fluctuate. Uh, but it will keep the blood pH very stable. Now, animals that are herbivores tend to have uh, sometimes uh, alkaline urine pHs, whereas animals that are carnivores always are going to have uh, an acidic pH unless they have a UTI. Okay, uh, urinary system is important for regulating the balance of water. Um, you know, when I went to college, we didn't come hydrated like you all do. Most of, like, at least half of you have water bottles with you, right? So when you drink excess water, which is good for you, um, your urinary system helps to get rid of that uh, through increased urination. It's also important for regulating blood pressure. Because the fluid that is in urine was once in blood, if we have too much blood volume, that's going to increase pressure. But the urinary system can get rid of extra volume and therefore reduce pressure. By the same token, if you have an animal, let's say, that's dehydrated, that's always had, already had some water loss, uh, the urinary system can help us retain as much water as possible so we don't have, uh, you know, go into hypovolemic shock or something like that. Okay, it also helps to maintain blood osmolality. That's just the ratio of salts to water. And of course, the kidney produces a hormone, uh, for example, erythropoietin. Okay, what was erythropoietin used for? Red blood, cell. Red blood cell production, good. And of course, excretion of water and other wastes. All right, let's look at the, uh, the uh, structural units of the kidney. So on the outside here, we have a capsule that's not labeled. And then just below that, we have the cortex. Uh, and then below the cortex, we have these renal columns and then these renal pyramids, which are part of the medulla. Okay. The kidney is interesting because imagine you were to open a kidney up. If you licked it, it would get saltier towards the inside of the kidney. And this saltiness is good because it helps to draw water out to be reabsorbed. Okay. 
So a renal pyramid is this structure right here, whereas the renal lobe is just the columns plus the overlying cortex plus the medulla. Okay. And then all the fluid is drained from these renal pyramids into these little structures right here. Anybody know what they're called? These things right here. Okay. Those are called the renal calyces. Calyx is singular, calyces are plural. Uh, I call these the Shrek ears, right? Because they look like Shrek's ears. Okay. And the fluid from each of these pyramids drains into a minor calyx, which then enters into a major calyx. So the calyces drain the filtrate, or now urine, and empty it into the renal pelvis. And this renal pelvis is where the urine accumulates until it's drained by the ureters. And the hilus right here is just the indentation where the blood vessels and the ureters uh, exit the kidney. Okay, so the kidney has a tremendous blood supply. In most mammals, we're talking about 25% of the cardiac output is being devoted to the kidneys. So high blood flow, okay, the renal arteries bring blood to our kidneys, and then within the nephron itself, we have an arterial called the afferent arterial bring blood into the glomerulus, the glomerulus itself, which is a capillary bed, and then afferent arterials bring blood away. And we also have some peritubular capillaries, which we'll show in here in just a minute. Okay, so nephron anatomy. The functional unit of a kidney is a nephron. So each kidney might have somewhere between 500,000 and a million nephrons. And this is where the important processes are occurring. So let's take a look at the parts of a nephron. First of all, we start out with something called a renal corpuscle. And the renal corpuscle is just the glomerulus, this little red structure here, plus the Bowman's capsule. This is where filtration occurs. Basically, blood comes in. This is the afferent arterial, brings blood into the glomerulus, and then it's drained by the efferent arterial. And what happens in capillary beds? Pressure goes down, but they're also leaky, so fluid leaks across. So any fluid that leaks across this capillary bed is caught by the Bowman's capsule. And then the Bowman's capsule drains that fluid into what we call the renal tubule. The renal tubule has mm, three or four parts. First here is something called the proximal convoluted tubule. What did proximal mean? Closer. Closer. And convoluted just means wavy, okay, so it's wavy. And then we have the loop of Henle, descending loop of Henle, ascending loop of Henle, and then the distal convoluted tubule. And finally, what we have right here is the collecting duct. Now, it's important to realize that anything that leaves this capillary bed that is filtered out and stays in this tubule and is not pulled back out will become part of the urine. Okay, so a little bit about blood vessels. We already showed the glomerulus, which was part of the renal corpuscle. That's where we have filtration occurring. The other type of blood vessel I want you to know about are the peritubular capillaries. These are capillaries that surround the loop of Henle because the other process that happens in a nephron is reabsorption. Uh, fluid that is in the tubule can be drawn out and reabsorbed back in the bloodstream. And so when that happens, it's going to move into these peritubular capillaries. Okay. So here's the three major processes. We've kind of already talked about one of them. Three things that a nephron does is filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. So filtration is this pressure-driven movement of fluids from the capillary bed into the Bowman's capsule. Okay. Remember, these capillaries are leaky. What kinds of things tend to leak out of a capillary bed? Water. What else? Salt. Salt. Okay. What kinds of things don't tend to leak out of a capillary bed? Red blood cells. Red blood cells. White blood cells. Okay. Usually, if they're working properly, there shouldn't be any blood in there. If we do start to see blood in the filtrate, it could mean we have some kidney problems. Okay. Um, reabsorption, on the other hand, is the movement of stuff from the tubule back in the bloodstream. In a minute, we're going to give a volume and say that in dogs, around 45 and 50 mils are created of filtrate every minute. And if you think about, okay, how many mils of filtrate would be created in an hour if it was 50 mils a minute? 50 mils a minute 300. times 60 minutes. 300. No. 3,000. 3,000 milliliters or 3 liters per an hour. 
So that's potentially how much your dog could be peeing three liters an hour if it wasn't reabsorbing something. So the, the bottom line is that a lot of stuff that is initially filtered actually gets reabsorbed back in the bloodstream. Okay. And then the third process is secretion. We take things that are still in the bloodstream, put them back in the tubule. So these would be waste products we don't want to hang on to. So anything that stays in that tubule and is not reabsorbed will become part of the urine. Okay, so let's look at the renal corpuscle at first. This is the afferent arterial, okay, bringing blood in. We've got our afferent arterial carrying blood away, our glomerulus, which is our really leaky capillary bed, and then our Bowman's capsule, okay. Um, okay. And then that drains into our proximal convoluted tubule. I like to compare this to a colander, right? The Bowman's capsule, the, um, the glomerulus is basically like a colander. It's a very leaky colander. And so the example here, imagine that this is blood and we're pouring blood into this colander. The cells here remain within the colander if everything's working right, but the fluid comes through. Okay. What would you think about your colander if you started finding noodles at the bottom of it? Get rid of it. Yeah, why, why get rid of it? It's wasting the noodles, and why are the noodles getting through? It's got holes in there, it's broken, right? And so we'll sometimes see that, we'll st start to see hematuria, blood in the urine, uh, protein in the urine, if there's been damage to the Bowman's capsule. So normally, we don't see blood cells in urine, we don't see proteins in urine, but if we start to see them, it can tell us that perhaps the, the glomerulus uh, has been destroyed or, or is damaged, oftentimes by high blood pressure. Okay. So filtration is a process happening in the glomerulus, and we talked about filtration before, okay? It's the pressure-driven movement of fluids and solutes um, from the blood capillaries, okay, out into the interstitial spaces. And the main pressure driving this is what? Diffusion. Not diffusion. Simply the contraction of the heart. Blood pressure. The pressure generated by the heart, high pressure in the arterioles, makes a little bit of pressure in the capillary bed, so it does force in this fluid out. Okay, so we call that blood hydrostatic pressure. Remember, that comes from the compression of the heart. Okay. There's a second small pressure called interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, or IFOP, um, and it's just because there are some solutes out here, and we know that solutes tend to suck water towards them. It's a very minor force. Okay. Reabsorption is the opposite of filtration, a movement of fluids from the interstitial spaces back into the capillary beds. Okay. The pressure components here are blood colloid osmotic pressure, okay, helping to suck this back in, and the blood colloids here are the plasma proteins, principally albumin. So albumin acts as a solute, it remains in the bloodstream, and because it remains there, it helps to suck water back in. And so together, these three pressures give us something called the net filtration pressure, okay, which is the net movement of fluid out of a capillary bed. Now, in most capillary beds, the amount filtered and the amount reabsorbed is about the same. Okay. This is not true for the glomerulus. We really have some adaptations which promote filtration because we want filtration to happen. We want to form this filtrate so we can get rid of waste products. So let's look at some pressures within the glomerulus. First of all, we have our glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. Where did that come from? The heart. The heart's just contracting, generating pressure. Okay, that's where this pressure came from. The pressure goes into this glomerulus, which is just a capillary bed, and it wants some stuff to leak out, but there's some pressures opposing it. The first of these is CHP, okay, standing for capsular hydrostatic pressure. Okay. Now, remember that the blood is a fluid, but also this capsule is filled with filtrate, which is a fluid. Has anyone ever, like you drink a fountain drink when you're a kid, you suck some of the fountain drink out and the straw, and then you blow it back into the container? Never did that? Okay. okay, anyway, the point being is there's some resistance when we force one fluid into another fluid. Okay, and that resistance here is equivalent to our capsular hydrostatic pressure. So this is sort of knocking some of our pressure right off the top. Now instead of having 55 as pressure, we have something around, what is that, 40? 30, 30, 40, yeah, 40 would be our net filtration pressure. But we also have BCOP. BCOP is the blood colloid osmotic pressure, okay? 
It's generated by our albumins in there in the bloodstream. And that's 30 millimeters of mercury. So if our GBHP from our heart is 55 and we subtract 30 for BCOP and we subtract 15 for our capsular hydrostatic pressure, what does that give us? 10. So that's our net filtration pressure is 10 millimeters of mercury. So let me give you a, a hypothetical. Let's imagine that this animal is hypotensive. Uh, it's lost some blood due to trauma, and its GBHP uh, is now 45 millimeters of mercury. What's its net filtration pressure? Zero. The kidneys have effectively shut down. And so if you have an animal that's hypovolemic or something like that, that's one of the concerns, that even if you can keep that animal going, we've got to make sure there's enough blood flow to the kidneys. So we see this in humans and people that have endured trauma, that are in shock. If we don't ensure high enough blood pressure and blood flow to the kidneys, they shut down. And this is important. You know, anytime you have a human that's in the hospital staying overnight, uh, or even animals in the veterinary hospital, what are you monitoring on those animals? Well, blood pressure, you're just monitoring ins and outs. Do you do that? You chart and say, okay, yeah, he drank some water today, yeah, an estimate, and you know, try to estimate did they urinate. How often do they go out? Are they not urinating? That's a bad sign. Uh, in people, in fact, they will often catheterize them and have a little bag collecting to measure the urine volume to make sure that they're producing uh, an appropriate amount of urine and also make sure that urine is concentrated. Okay, we're going to talk about something called glomerular filtration rate. And that's basically the rate at which filtrate is formed in the glomerulus. Okay, everything that stays in the blood is blood, but everything that moves out of the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule becomes something called filtrate. And so we're going to talk about the glomerular filtration rate. In humans, this is about 125 mils per minute. In dogs and cats, it depends on the size of the animal. But uh, for a 25-pound dog, we're talking about something around 45 mils of filtrate gener generated per a minute. And again, if we just round this up to 50 and say, how much filtrate is that in an hour? That's three liters. Uh, but if we look at how much filtrate is it over 24 hours, it's about 16 gallons. Okay. Now, how much blood volume do you think a 25-pound dog would have? Is it more or less than 16 gallons? Or, you know, yeah, I would hope a 25-pound dog would not have 16 gallons of blood. It would be like a tick. Um, so yeah, the point is it doesn't have anywhere near that, right? It has a few pints of blood at best. So it's filtering this blood continuously throughout the day. And the fact that it's not producing that much urine is because the majority of the volume that's filtered is what? Reabsorbed. Okay, the majority of the filtrate is going to be reabsorbed. So this animal will only produce about 680 mils of urine over a 24-hour period, even though it's filtering something like 60, 16 gallons. Okay, so let's talk about reabsorption and secretion. So reabsorption happens all throughout the renal tubule. And the first part of the renal tubule is a proximal convoluted tubule. So one of the things you should be able to do for an exam, hint, hint, is draw for me the renal tubule and glomerulus. Okay, so we've got our afferent arterial coming into our glomerulus, which is just a capillary bed. So fluid is leaking out there moves into our Bowman's capsule. And then what was this structure here called? Proximal convoluted tubule, PCT. Okay, this is a major site of reabsorption. Okay. We reabsorb water here. We reabsorb salt here and chloride. And we also reabsorb uh, all the glucose that we reabsorb. Okay. And so first of all, let's talk about osmolality. Um, what is osmolality or osmolarity, you think? Salt ratio of solutes to water. Okay. Now, the normal uh, ratio of solutes to water for blood is around 300 milliosmoles. And that's actually the osmolarity of the filtrate as well, 300 milliosmoles. Okay. And what happens here is that we have special 
proteins that help to move out sodium and chloride, and along that follows water. So we tend to pull out sodium and water in a one-to-one -one fashion. So how's that going to change the osmolality? Here, imagine I have 100 molecules. 50 of them are sodium, 50 of them are water molecules. And I pull out two of those, one water and one sodium. How's that going to change the osmolality? No change. Okay. So that's what's happening here. We're sort of pulling out water and sodium at the same ratio to where we're reducing the volume of fluid in here, but we're not changing the osmolality. So we stay at 300. The other thing that comes across is we move out all of the glucose, right? Blood has glucose in order to supply our uh, body with energy, in order to supply the nervous system, which runs primarily on glucose. So why wouldn't we want our glucose to be ending up in our urine? You lose energy. You lose energy. It's wasteful, right? We'd have to keep producing blood glucose if we're peeing it all away. So normally, we shouldn't see any glucose in the urine because it's all reabsorbed right here at the proximal convoluted tubule. All right, and then let's look at the descending loop of Henle. Now, in the descending loop of Henle, we're reabsorbing water, but not reabsorbing salts. So here we have special receptors that allow water to move out, but it will not allow salt to move out. So if we have, again, 50 molecules of water, 50 salt ions in there, and we're just pulling the water out, what's that going to do to the osmolality of what's left over? More salty. So the number's going to go up. So look at these numbers. They're going from 300 to 350 to 650. 750. You don't need to memorize these numbers. You just need to memorize trends. Okay. It's getting saltier the further we go down in that tube because we're pulling the water out. So the descending limb of the loop of Henle is permeable to water, but it's not permeable to salt. Remember, I said that as we go down in the medulla, we get saltier and saltier within the kidney, and that helps us to draw water out. On the ascending limb, on the other hand, we're permeable to salt. We're spending active transport at getting sodium back out again, but we're not allowing water out. So what does this do to the osmolality? Yeah, it makes it go down again. 400, what do we go up to? 150. And then finally we get up here where we're about 100. So by the time we get to the distal convoluted tubule, we're at about 100 milliosmoles, which is saltier or less salty than blood? Less. less. We're about a third of the saltiness of blood. So what we're going to do next depends on whether we want to produce a lot of dilute urine or a little bit of concentrated urine. We're going to talk about what happens in the collecting duct. Okay. So the big thing with the distal convoluted tubule is that we still have reabsorption of sodium chloride. Uh, we also have uh, reabsorption of calcium here. But now we need to talk about the collecting duct because the collecting duct is a spot where we can have facultative water reabsorption. So, so far we've talked about something called obligatory water reabsorption, which is just, it's going to happen whether we like it or not. And all the other water reabsorption we've had is obligatory. There's no way to tweak it, to adjust it. But here at the collecting duct, we can have facultative water reabsorption. We can choose to reabsorb it or choose not to. Why would we choose not to reabsorb water? Adequately hy hydrated. Maria's adequately hydrated back there. I'm sorry, just drinking on there. Okay, so in that case, the body's going to be like, okay, I don't need that extra water. We'll just leave it in the duct and that'll end up as urine. But now I want you to imagine something. You, have you ever had those mornings where you're getting up, you're feeding your pet, doing your things? Oh, the water bowl's dirty. I'm going to wash that and put some new water, and you forgot to do it. You put the water bowl up on the counter, you forgot to put it back down for your pet. It's there all by himself. He's whining, okay. No water for the whole day. So how's that going to change that animal? Okay, its blood's going to get more salty, right? Higher osmolality. And in that case, if it's going to produce urine, does it want to produce a lot of urine or a little bit of urine? It wants to produce a little bit of concentrated urine. And so the hormone here involved is ADH. Where is ADH produced? It's produced in the hypothalamus, secreted by the posterior pituitary. So here's the brain, here's the hypothalamus, 
anterior, posterior pituitary, and ADH is secreted by our posterior pituitary under the direction of the hypothalamus. And what that ADH does is it causes the insertion of these special little doors into the wall of the collecting duct, and these are called aquaporins. So the aquaporins normally aren't there unless there's ADH present. And the aquaporins just let more and more water out. There's these little water gates. And where's this water going once it gets out of the tubule here? Back into the capillaries, back in the bloodstream. So when the animal's dehydrated, bam, lots of ADH. ADH is going to help pull uh, as much water out as possible, in which case we'll see urine that has a very high osmolality. Okay? Uh, on the other hand, if the animal's you know, adequately hydrated, we don't have near as much ADH. So we're going to have a dilute urine. So what would this urine look like, by the way? Coloration? Super dark, super yellow. Okay. This would be an example of uh, a well-concentrated urine from an animal that you know, is maybe a little bit dehydrated. Oftentimes, the first urination of the day will be darker because the animal's been asleep. It's not been drinking for eight hours or so. Uh, on the other hand, once the animal's well hydrated, it's going to have a light, lighter concentration. So two hormones are primarily responsible for regulating the body's ability to either concentrate or not concentrate the urine, uh, and those are ADH and also aldosterone. ADH acts on the aquaporins, whereas aldosterone acts on uh, sodium reabsorption. But when we reabsorb sodium, water tends to follow it. So both of them have a net effect at helping the body retain water and produce a very concentrated urine. OK, now there are diuretics. We've talked about these with people, right? Um, alcohol is a diuretic. And how does that cause us to lose water? It inhibits the ADH. Hmm? It inhibits the ADH. Inhibits ADH, causes urine, uh, less ADH, which means less aquaporins, more urine production. Do we ever use alcohol on patients? Ethyl, ethylene glycol poisoning, right. Uh, I remember years ago when I first went to the veterinary clinic, and I go in back there, and our veterinarian's got this big bottle of Absolute on his desk. And you're like, mm-hmm. You know, it's like, <laughs> never would have picked him for a drinker. You know, just, uh, but actually, what they were using it for is if they have dogs that have antifreeze poisoning, I don't, I'm not sure how they administer it, where they do you all give it orally, or is it? OK. Yeah, I've never, yeah, I've never seen it done either. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's just like a giant bottle of like Wolfenstein vodka or something like that. Oh, yeah. So um, it, uh, yeah, but they can use it because it, it helps to prevent the precipitation of the crystals. And it also just helps to flush the kidneys out because ethylene glycol causes kidney damage. Um, among humans, obviously, caffeine uh, is a diuretic, but we also have some medical diuretics as well. Uh, in humans, things like Lasix are what we call loop diuretics, that they prevent this gradient from being formed and pre prevent water reabsorption. And we often use those to treat uh, hypertension because they reduce blood volume. OK, just to note that secretion is occurring as well. Uh, secretion was the movement of substances from uh, from inside the bloodstream actually back into the tubule. So mainly we're talking about things like hydrogen ions, potassium ions, ammonia. Uh, we're secreting those uh, from the blood because we don't want them back into the tubule where they will be uh, eliminated. Um, we'll talk about something called clearance rate. Clearance rate is the rate at which any ion or metabolite uh, moves uh, out of the bloodstream and is uh, eliminated by the kidneys. So we talk about this in the terms of pharmaceuticals and so on. How long does it take to clear them from the body? Because areas that metabolize drugs, we want to think of uh, the lungs uh, for you know, gas anesthetics, but uh, also the liver. But the kidneys is another site where we excrete or get rid of anesthetic drugs and other drugs as well. So you know, people know this if they ever like, have to go to their employer for a drug test. You know, you're really well uh, informed drug, you will know just how long uh, they have to abstain from you know, marijuana or whatever before that metabolite no longer shows up in their urine. OK. Um, now that we've talked about the kidneys and their functions, just briefly mention something about the ureters and the urinary bladder. The bladder's there to accumulate urine so the animal can choose to urinate when it wants to and not urinate all the time. Um, why is it to an advantage for an animal to have a urinary bladder? They're not, they're not peeing all the time, dribbling on themselves. 
they can mark where they want to mark. That makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, so it makes sense to me that you know, dogs and cats and people, you know, you don't want to pee where you're sleeping or something like that. But fish have urinary bladders too, which I've never understood. It's just like, you know, it's like one big toilet. You can just pee all you want. Nobody would know, but they have a urinary bladder. But they can smell their pee. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Maybe they can smell their pee. Because I understand that with poo, right? You know, with, with defecation, animals will definitely defecate away from their nest so they don't draw on predators, but I don't understand the pee and fish. Um, okay, micturation is the reflex of urination. Okay, it's a parasympathetic reflex. It does involve voluntary and also involuntary muscle contraction. Uh, the only voluntary thing we control is the skeletal muscle sphincter at the end of the urethra that allows uh, the urine to pass out. Okay, urinalysis. Remember before I said that urine is basically filtered blood. And so because blood goes to all the organs in the body, we can learn a lot by looking at the blood, or in this case, by looking at the urine. So we can learn about the health of the kidneys, but we can also learn about the health of other organs as well. Okay, so several different types of diagnosis can start with urinalysis. And urinalysis has one benefit over uh, looking at blood is that it's non-invasive, right? We don't have to take a sample in there. On the other hand, it's a lot harder to get a urine sample from an animal than it is from a person, right? You can't just send them in a little room with a little cup. Uh, how many people have taken a urine sample for their dog? So you've done one, you've done one. How did you do it? You just walk the dog in and you go in a cup. Right. <laughs> it's a little bit harder than that. I mean, it's not like the dog's like, you know, oh, hey, how are you doing? All right, you know. It's easier with the girls. It's easier with the girls. A boy dog, you go up there and they start to hike out and you're like, Whoop, like that, and they're like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> and so it can be tricky. People were talking about plates and things like that. Uh, for cats, it's particularly it's really hard. hard. Um, there's actually a way you can do that, depending on how clean sterile urine needs to be. You get a litter box and they actually have just aquarium gravel or something that's non absorbent, but will still stimulate their urination reflex, and you can just you know, pour the stuff out afterwards. The other ways we can do it is we can do a manual expression. You can express the bladder or catheterization or even cystocentesis. Uh, cystocentesis is where we actually have an animal with a full bladder and we put a needle into it and you draw the urine out that way. It sounds super freaky. Have you done one? How easy was it? It's easy. It's easy, yeah. But it is freaky the first time you're like, what organ am I going into right there? <laughs> Like if you draw back and there's brown stuff, that's a bad inside and you puncture the intestine. But usually the bladder is actually laying up front, so it's not a big deal. And the good thing about collecting uh, urine this way is that it hasn't yet been through the urethra. So it's not contaminated. Urine itself, you've always heard, say, urine is sterile. Well, yes, except when it's not. After it goes through the urethra, it is no longer sterile. And particularly if we have a UTI, it's not sterile anyway. But the urethra is dirty. And so we sometimes want to look at urine before it goes through the urethra. All right, so what can we look at in urine? What can we learn about? Well, first of all, we can learn how well the kidneys are working. We measure something called specific gravity. Specific gravity is just a ratio of solids to water. So it's telling us about the weight or the density of the fluid. Normally, distilled water has a specific gravity of 1.000. That is, one milliliter of water should weigh exactly one gram. As we add solute to it, the number goes up. And so basically, we take a drop of urine, we put it on this refractometer. It looks like a little miniature clarinet, but it has a prism in there. And once the urine's placed there, we cover it up, and you can see this little horizon here. And it's got numbers here between the blue and the white. And it tells you uh, the specific gravity, how concentrated it is. And a normal dog should be somewhere between a 1.015 uh, to 1.045. Okay, that's a nice concentrated sample. If it's closer to 1.000, it means the kidneys are not working properly. They're not concentrating urine enough, and so that animal's losing more water than it should with each urination. Okay. The other thing that we can learn from the urine is we can learn whether there's glucose in there. We can learn whether you have a urinary tract infection, whether there's blood in there, whether there's protein in there. Uh, all kinds of things can be learned from these special dipsticks in there. Um, there's about 10 different tests on there. Yeah. All right, so what do we see with the dips dipsticks? These are really cool. So again, we can look at glucose proteins, uh, presence of blood cells. Um, we can look at the pH, which is very important. Normally, the pH 
in uh, carnivores, it's going to be 5 to 6. We have an acidic pH. If we look at uh, herbivorous animals, like cows and things like that, rabbits might even have an alkaline pH in there. And it's interesting because the pH of urine can vary quite widely. Again, if you take bicarbonate or something like that, your pH can shoot from something around 4 or 5, or 5 normally, up to 9. Okay, and so that's an abrupt change in pH. And we can get certain problems at a basic pH. Uh, we can get urinary tract infections and so forth. Um, diabetes uh, is also something that can be partially diagnosed through looking at urine. So we have two different types. The one that you're familiar with is diabetes mellitus or mellitus. Okay, and this, both types of diabetes we have PU, PD, polyuria, polydyspia. Okay, and the animal is urinating a lot, it's one of the first signs. Um, in mellitus, though, we have something called glycosuria. We have glucose present within the urine, and that's abnormal, because normally we shouldn't have any glucose in the urine, but diabetes mellitus we do, and we'll talk about why in just a minute. Diabetes insipidus, on the other hand, uh, we still have polyuria, but we don't have glycosuria. So we're just urinating a lot, but the cause here is not uh, too much blood sugar, the cause is inappropriate amounts of ADH. So something's wrong with the pituitary, it's not making enough ADH. So a little bit more about glycosuria. Uh, normally, where is our glucose uh, reabsorbed? In what part of the nephron? In the proximal convoluted tubule. So does anybody know what a normal blood sugar is for a mammal? Around 90, yeah, somewhere around there, 90 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. And so what happens if we have an animal that has diabetes mellitus and we imagine that it has too much blood glucose, it's going to change things. So normally we have little checkout lanes here, just like checkout lanes in a grocery store that allow glucose to move out. And these are the only checkout lanes for glucose. So if we have 90, milligram, millig, we have 90 milligrams uh, per deciliter of glucose, there's enough checkout lanes to move, remove it all as it passes through the proximal convoluted tubule. So just like you walk into longs and you have just enough checkout people to deal with each of the customers. But on the other hand, what happens if you have double the number of customers and still the same number of checkout lanes? Okay, after a while, you probably won't have enough checkout lanes to get the customers done in a quick enough time. So think about longs on like, you know, coupon day or something like that when there's just a thousand people in there and two uh, checkers. And what, what happens is there's so much glucose that there's not time for that glucose to be completely reabsorbed. Uh, and so some of it remains in the tubule. There's nowhere else in the tubule for it to be reabsorbed. And remember, glucose is acting as a solute here. And what do solutes do? They suck, so they suck water towards them or at least prevent water from being reabsorbed out of the tubule. And that's why one of the symptoms of diabetes mellitus is this polyuria, excessive urination. And so that's easily detectable by a simple glucose strip there. Um, okay, other diseases of the uh, urinary system is renal failure. Okay, chronic renal failure is something we see in cats. It happens in people as well. But oftentimes, we don't realize an animal has a problem until they're symptomatic, okay? Until the owner brings their animal in and says, gosh, he's been urinating a lot, and he's lethargic and uh, sort of anemic, uh, anorexic anyway. And it indicates uh, irreversible uh, destruction of nephrons within the kidney. Uh, and so usually we're talking about, in humans, again, a glomerular filtration rate of around 125. In a dog, it might be 45. But at this point, we're down to like 15. Okay, so our GFR has gone way down. And we're also able to notice other abnormalities in the lab work. Azotemia, which is just um, an accumulation of nitrogen-rich compounds in the blood. Things like urea. Okay, urea is a breakdown byproduct of protein metabolism. So when animals you know, metabolize proteins, they have urea and uh, ammonia left over, and those are normally excreted in the urine. But when the kidneys aren't working right, that just accumulates in the blood. Okay. The other thing we'll see is proteinuria and hematuria. This just means protein in the blood, and blood 
sorry, protein in the urine and blood in the urine. These are abnormal. Okay, so oftentimes we don't even begin to evaluate that animal until he or she begins to show some signs. Now, if we're looking at an older cat and is 16 years old, probably your veterinarian, if you're bringing them in, would, would recommend, hey, let's do a blood panel. Let's look at, you know, BUN and just see if it's elevated so we can monitor uh, that. So other things is the cat comes in, looks kind of like this. It's ADR. It has weight, light, weight loss. It's not eating, uh, lethargy. What does ADR mean? Ain't doing right. Just not doing right. Don't know why. Okay, polyuria, polydyspia. This happened a couple years ago. A friend of mine, his wife brought their cat in, and she noticed that it was drinking a lot, that it was peeing a lot, and it was about 16, 17. She thought, oh, maybe just diabetes. But this is a weird time for a cat to become diabetic. Um, and so we did some simple blood tests, and sure enough, it had elevated levels of uh, blood urea nitrogen. Uh, blood creatinine levels were also elevated, so very clear that it was kidney disease. Now, how do we treat this in a cat? Anybody know? Yeah, really. Hmm? You can't yeah, you can just do, you know, basically we can't reverse the kidney damage. What they often do is they'll send that person home with uh, a bag of fluids and just have them do subcutaneous fluids, you know, once a day or twice a day or something like that. All right, other things we can get is obviously we can get um, calculi within the bladder. So these are bladder stones. Uh, we can get something like magnesium phosphate, um, oxalate crystals, uh, other things like that. So just like we can get urine, uh, st or just like we can get uh, kidney stones, we can get bladder stones. And the composition of them depends on whether the animal's a uh, herbivore or a car carnivore, or what kind of diet it has. Uh, we tend to see struvite in there if the, the, uh, if the urine's more uh, basic, I think. Um, and so sometimes when we get these bladder stones, how can we treat them? You can do surgery, okay. You could, you could do a lithotomy where you go in and dig that thing out. They don't do that that often. Oftentimes there's a diet they will try to put them on depending on the type of, of stone that's in there. Uh, and the way they can tell is they can do an x-ray, but they also, if they have a stone in there, chances are there's crystals in the urine, there's crystalluria. And we can look at the composition of those crystals and guess what the stone might be made up. And so there's special diets that we can give this animal that, you know, if it's a, a, a struvite crystal or something like that, maybe an acidic diet or something like that will help uh, to break that up. Um, but it obviously it looks very uncomfortable to have these huge bladder stones in there. So these are just some of the struvite crystals and also uh, struvite stones. Again, uh, urinary tract infections can precipitate some types of stones uh, because urinary tract infections, we introduce bacteria there that begin to change the pH of the urine and also alter its composition as well. So they can actually potentiate uh, some of these uh, urinary calculi. Uh, anyway, that's it in a nutshell. Are there any questions about the urinary system?